Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit, the free online repair manual for everything. Before you start your next build or fix, head over to ifixit.com slash twit to snag the fully loaded ProTech Toolkit for only $59.99 and check out their array of high quality parts, tools, and guides. And by Tracker, a coin size tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com slash knowhow to save 20% off your order. I'm a little bit of networking. And I'm a little bit of rock and roll. Today on Know How, it's a feedback episode. Your questions are answers. Show where we build Ben Break and evidently smash guitars. Oh, I'm sorry I ever did like this we to you. Are rock stars. Oh my goodness. That's my, probably my... not a guitar you want to smash, right? <laughs> I really feel bad now. I feel guilt. I feel Taylor <laughs> destruction guilt. I, di- I didn't even mean to threaten you, guitar. I'm very sorry. Uh, there, I, there was a there was recently a movie where someone ha- was supposed to have a really expensive guitar <gasps> and. Which one was uh, it? It was the Hey Flight. Hey, that's right. That's and right. it was a Martin guitar, oh. super historic Martin guitar. I don't want to give any spoilers, but basically, yep. at some point, there was supposed to be a prop Martin They're put in to place of it. stop them, hand him the, the prop guitar, and then he smashes that. And, and he it, smashes it, oops. and it, it, because he was caught up in the moment, he didn't know that... Uh, anyways, that was the priceless one. It, it was heartbreaking. Like, yeah. it's this old, historic, like, in a museum model guitar, and it's destroyed. Every time I think about that, I think of that scene from Battlestar Galactica, the re series. There's the ship that he's been building this entire time, up to the point where, spoiler, Starbuck dies. And at the end of that that, big spoiler. that episode, he destroys it. Like, his, his grief is so great. They were supposed to swap that out. <laughs> and they didn't tell him. And so he destroyed this ship that had, like, literally, like, 10,000 man hours put into it. So Yeah, well, what's great about The Hateful Eight when you watch it is that I think it's Jennifer Jason Lee her reaction to it because she That's realizes a yeah, genuine reaction. is a genuine reaction. It's actually out <laughs> outside of her character. Like it actually goes counter to what her character has been at that point. But she's just so heartbroken. She's like, oh, and you see that expression on her face. And that's how I feel when I watch that scene. I'm just like, no. But we're not here to smash up guitars no. and, and props on set. What we or are here are to we? do, Jason, oh. is to give people a feedback episode. Right on. I love feedback episodes. And, and we, we, we don't, don't do know how you guys get a lot of feedback. We do. We, uh, we have a very active community. They a lot of projects, they ask a lot of really good questions. I don't work them into the show enough, so every once in a while we have to stop and do a yeah. series of them. So yep. again, I'm sorry, but here we are. Breathe in, breathe out, <sighs> and let's go. Now, there breathe. is always, always on Know How, a trend is networking stuff. People like to be able to network, they like to be able to do their own networking, and really, they're interested in making their homes, their offices, their whatever, sort of the, the geeks network paradise. Mm-hmm. So we've got a really good question from T. Nohans, longtime member of the community. And uh, he asks, can we please get another networking 101 about how to install wired networks? We've seen premise wiring, but we never really touched the difference in types of Ethernet cable. More to the point, where and how to invest money in cables such as Plenum versus Shielded, Riser, in-wall rated, bare copper, stranded copper, solid copper, or SFP and SFP+. Do we future-proof with CAT 6A, CAT 7, SFP+. What do we look for when installing wired networking? Should we use outdoor rated for exterior cameras or other devices? So many choices that boggle the mind. So what, when, where, why, and how? Also how and where to shop. So, Father Robert, can you uh, go over some of this? Uh, that seems like an encyclopedia that, that um, No Hands is asking for. It, it an is. Encyclopedia of networking. And that's, that's actually, like literally every single thing that could possibly <laughs> be talked about in networking, right? Precisely. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's that's not like something we can do as a feedback <laughs> item. That's like a show or a series yeah, of shows. Yeah, series. Uh, but, but it's a very good question because sure. we, we've done premise wiring actually like two or three times before. Uh, but I, I haven't gone into some of the differences. What we're going to do is we're going we're to break out a couple of the topics from this question, and we'll give you that. And then I, I promise down the road when we get back into the 10, actually I think it'd be the 104 series, we'll do a more in-depth 
premise wiring episode. Uh, now, Jason, the, the big one here, though, is when people start running wires through their houses, their offices, whatever it might be, they will probably hear things like unshielded twisted pair, UTP, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. shielded twisted pair, or plenum. And you'll get all sorts of advice about what you need for, for what installation. Uh, a lot of people just go into a store and say, I need a box of an Ethernet cable, and they'll, they'll get whatever box there is. When, at what point do they find out whether they lucked into the right answer or the wrong answer? Well, it will be pretty obvious because the right answer is ridiculously expensive. Oh, OK. Yeah. Most of us opt for the wrong answer because it's a quarter of the price Got or it. more. Actually, okay. probably an eighth of the price. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so let's let's break that out first. When we're talking about plenum, we're actually talking about the cable that go into what's called the plenum space. So anytime you're building a house or an office or even a studio like this, the places where you have air circulation, where you can run feeds and ducts, that's called the plenum space. So we have a plenum space here under the, the, uh, the floor. Right. There's actually a, a raised floor. We also have a plenum space up top because we've got a drop-down ceiling. So the space between the drop-down ceiling and the roof is a plenum space. Uh, we've also got plenum spaces in the walls. You know, anytime you have like an air gap, that's a plenum space. Well, what we like about plenum spaces is that they typically will run through the entire construction, which means I have access to everything. So mm -hmm. if I'm running cable, that's my way to get from one spot, typically where my switches are, to everywhere else in the house. So it's right? not gonna be obstructed along the way. It's just kind of an open space as long as you can get access to Precisely. there, up there in two points. You can get the thing that you need. And Precisely, yeah. Because we've all seen it done the other way, where people like are stapling yes. copper along the wall, and yeah, then they'll staple too me. deeply and destroy. Yeah, it, it looks bad. It <laughs> just looks bad. Yeah. And you know, over time, that's it's going to get destroyed. If you put it in the plenum space, um, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and it does tend to look a lot better. Mm -hmm. Problem with that, Jason, um, the copper that we would typically buy, if you go to that first link, this is, this is a pretty good example. You know, $34, when I buy these, I, I typically buy you know, 10 boxes at a time, so it'll go down as low as $20. This is what a typical box of copper that you would install looks like. This is Cat5e, which is kind of the standard. It's 1,000 feet. I can go for 100 meters, about 300 feet per run before I start running into signal problems. I've got four what are called twisted pairs. So four pairs of two wires that are twisted together. Mm -hmm. And that keeps me from having signal attenuation. Uh, when I twist the pairs like that, you actually have an effect where they, they help to keep the signal running through the copper a, a little bit more, well, uh, good. Mm -hmm. yeah, before before <laughs> it turns better. into nothing. It, it keeps it much, <laughs> much more better. So this is what copper like this would look, look like typically. This is, this is category 5E. This is category 6. This is getting a lot thicker. I've got a, you know, this is what's called riser cable mm -hmm. because this actually has a membrane in there that uh, it would hold against its own weight. So I could run this up walls, uh, multiple stories, and it's not going to split. Now, here's the thing. That super cheap cable we like because it's easy to work with, because it's inexpensive, and because I can run a lot of it inside of a plenum space. Mm -hmm. you know, if I need 30 drops for my house, a, a bundle of, uh, of that 5E cable will be like maybe that big. Versus this, this is category 6, a bundle of this cable would be like this You know, mm -hmm. for, th for 30 runs. Um, now, also we like that because I can use tools like this, super simple tools, super cheap tools to crimp and to manage my own connections. So typically what I would do for a premise wiring job is I would have a patch panel in my main area where all my switches are. I would terminate into that patch panel and on the other side of every run I would have a box in the wall that has what are called keystone jacks and it would terminate there. So I now have two patch points that I can use to tie it into my switch, into my router, into devices, whatever it might be. Cool? Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Here's the thing. That cheap cable doesn't, isn't supposed to go into those plenum spaces. What, what's happening in those plenum spaces that would, that would require a different type of cable? Fire. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this is actually, this is a big thing. This is not anything to joke about. Uh, consider this. This type of cable, this, the super cheap cable that you would buy a lot of in just a standard box of, uh, of a copper that you might buy for Amazon or Fryzotronics or you know, whatever your local supply might be, uh, it's strong enough to handle its own weight and it's typically good, it's durable, but if I were to happen to short something through this, let's say I ran it too close to an AC line and uh, the insulation wore down and now it's sending AC through some of the, the copper uh, mm -hmm. pairs in this thing, it would actually heat up to the point where the the, the, uh, the patch would burn, it would uh, burst into flames. 
and there's nothing to stop it from burning. This will just continue to burn. And if you got it in a plenum space, now you're, you've got a fire in a place right. you can't get to. Plus, wow. it's releasing okay. a lot of toxic smoke. That's not... You yeah, know, generally no. not, not preferred. We don't like that. We yeah. don't like that. Uh, so what we're looking for is we're looking for a different kind of cable. We're looking for what's called plenum cable. It's you know, imaginatively named. It's, it's cable that's designed to specifically go into those spaces. Now, it's got a couple of different things about it. The, but the biggest thing is that the material that the jacket is made out of is it's fire resistant. And it's a special kind of fire resistance. If the jacket on a plenum cable starts to melt, so let's say that's that same situation, I'm shorting AC power through my copper pairs, it starts to melt, it will actually smother the fire. So it stops fires dead. Uh, and it's also very low smoke, so you don't get a lot of the toxic smoke coming off, mm -hmm. of the, off of the copper. So even if you were to continue to supply power through those cables, you'd, you'd have a mess, but you wouldn't have a major fire and you wouldn't kill everyone in the house, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, you probably are, are hoping for that when you yeah. install pretty much anything in the place that you live. Yeah, I think I in, in the review box, I yeah. had a fire, <laughs> didn't kill everyone. A plus, ten. yeah. It's gonna have ten. Very well done. <laughs> One problem. That's the cable we should be using, but Alex, if you go to that second link, uh, yeah. So from wow, about 25, okay. 25 to thirty dollars to two hundred dollars a box. Dang. It's the same category and it's the same length. Wow. So it is. It's not just a little more expensive. It is significantly more expensive. And I mean, people are just going to opt for the other out of sheer yeah. cost. It's because that's no little savings. No, that's no. a huge. Right. Savings. That's the difference between being able to afford it and not being able to afford it. So yeah. then I'm sure a lot of people would just be like, yeah, but I want to do it, so I'm going to do it. Precisely. And, and, and I get it. I get it. Because people are saying, well, I'm, I can't network my house at $200 per right. 1,000 feet. Yeah. Because I'm going to need five of these boxes. Although 1,000 feet sounds like, or right, just in sheer numbers, sounds like a lot. But I imagine when you're looping through all of these spaces, right. going up walls, you know, through ceilings and everything, that gets eaten up pretty well, quick. you have to remember when you're, when you're running, if you're properly running, uh, you don't go serial. So you don't go to this room and then to that room and then to that right. room and to that. You go from one point to all every point. Out. It's like a spider. Precisely. So <laughs> they all have to come back to that central distribution yeah. unit. So 1,000 feet is actually not that much. I mean, if you've got a house where uh, you've got one room, that's the furthest away from the panel, and it takes uh, 200 feet of cable, and you want three drops in there, that's 600 feet of cable. Yeah, You've yeah. just used up most of the box for that one room. <laughs> uh, and, and now, you know, you do the other rooms in the house. So, it, yeah, you, you typically do need a couple of boxes of this stuff. Right. Uh, you could make the very, very, very good argument that it's worth it because, you know, how expensive is your house mm -hmm. or how is it? Yeah, it's like an insurance. Kids. <laughs> it's like you're, you're, you're paying for insurance, essentially. Right. But so many people have used standard cable over the years that they just kind of say, well, nothing's happened. I'm still not right. dead. Right. Yeah. Mm. I, I will say, if you go to an electrician, a, a good electrician, one who actually knows his or her craft, they will always use plenum in plenum spaces. Uh, but well, I, I'm surprised that they wouldn't be required to do that. You are. That, that, through yeah. code. I mean, if, if, if someone comes in and inspects your house and you've got non-plenum cable in a plenum yeah. space, they will tell you that that's not up to code. Got it. Uh, but most people don't get inspected for that. So. Right. <laughs> they do that's also, think. by the way, if you've ever wondered why it's sometimes more expensive when you have the, the cable pre-done in the mm -hmm. house, it's because they have to use cable that's up to code. So it's going to be the expensive stuff. Got it. All right. Yep. So that's the plenum versus non-plenum. Now let's talk about uh, another part of T. Nohan's uh, feedback. He wanted to know a little bit about, well, how do I future-proof? And I know people who say, well, I'm going to run Category 6 or Category 7, and then they're going to put in these monstrous type cables. Um, you can do that. I, I wouldn't. Uh, and and there, there's a good reason for that. Category 5E will do 1 gig Ethernet all the way up to 300 meters. Oh, sorry, 100 meters, which is about 330 feet. That's plenty. That speed is more than enough for almost all the devices that you might have on your network. The only reason why you would want Category 6 or Category 7 is if you're planning to run 10 gig over copper. And the thing about running 10 gig is it's not so easy to terminate. You almost need a professional to come in to do those terminations. Otherwise, you won't actually get the 10 gig speed. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, if you're going to be doing 10 gig, I would suggest fiber way, way over copper. It's actually easier to terminate fiber for 10 gig than it is to terminate copper. Um, but the, the last thing, I want to throw this one out because this is, this is actually important. The most important thing that you can put in your house is not Category 5 or Category 6 or Category 7 or fiber or whatever it might be. The most important thing you can put in your house 
is conduit. Because once you run conduit, you have an easy way to replace all the cables. Mm. I know it's a pain in the butt. I get that. I understand it. And it's expensive. However, if you do the job right, you only have to do it once. Yep. And then you every, you've future-proofed. You're future-proofed. Because yep. every time you want to replace, all you got to do is tie on the new whatever it might be onto the end. You pull it back to the distribution panel. You, you plug it in, and you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, there you go. Oh, and again, we're going to do a full episode on this because this, these are some very, very good questions and they deserve some very good answers. And uh, actually, you know, Brian used to be my cable buddy. Oh, uh, do okay. you want to learn how to do terminations in the future? Absolutely. I've, I've been very curious about this, actually. Um, when we first bought our the home that we live in now, we've been there about four years, I needed to run Ethernet from our living room into the den where I have my computer right. my music Naturally. set up, um, and I didn't want it to rely on Wi-Fi. And the thought of getting into the walls or running cable, or, you know, and I don't fit underneath our home. I'm just a little bit too tall. So uh, Twits Burke helped me with that. There we go. And so he helped me do that and he did, you know, all of the terminations and all that kind of stuff to feed it through and everything. Um, it would be nice to know how to do that myself. So I would, I would be very interested. Yeah. yeah. Not, not to have to rely on the Burke factor, although thank you, Burke. Uh, the internet's still holding up beautifully in my den. We, we love the Burke factor. The yeah. Burke factor's good. Yes, yeah, it's I just agree. Sometimes the Burke factor's you know, He needs a break. Burkey. Yeah. Mm. I don't know what that means, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun, and I'll teach you how to use the crimpers, how to use the cutters. I'll, yeah. I'll teach you all the proper technique. Right uh, and once you know how to do it yourself, yeah, uh, it gets a lot easier because right now it's like, well, I don't want to mess with it because if it, if I destroy it, then yep. I don't have it connectivity in that room. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, did Did you wire your house yourself? Uh, no. You, know, you went wireless. Um, well, we, we, all we did was take the Ethernet from the living room where it comes into the house and feed it into the den so that I could have that direct connection. Everywhere else, it's just all wireless. Yeah. 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 We, okay. did, we didn't go into all the other rooms. I don't know if we necessarily need to. You know what I mean? Like, it, the Internet's where it really needs to be. Are you sure, though? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe when my kids get a little older and they need a computer in their room, but I figure that's a long ways down the line. And wireless technology is probably going to be better then than it is now. Or am I wrong? Uh, well, okay. See, okay. And, and my audience has heard this spiel from me okay. before. But I love wireless, but wireless is a convenience technology. It is not an infrastructure technology. Yeah. Because there is a there is a limit. It's the it's a physics limit. There's sure. only so much RF energy that you can pump into the air before you get diminishing returns versus copper. If I have copper into every room, every room can get the maximum throughput from that copper. So <laughs> the, the, the other part of this uh, is that I'm lazy. Yeah, okay, okay, hey, no, I'm, I'm cool, I'm cool. Got, got lots of other things going on. <laughs> but, but Jason, you know, that was the networking part. Yeah. We had promised the audience some rock and roll. Yeah, okay, this is where I break and, my guitar. And the, well, the, no, not yet, not oh, yet. Oh, okay. But the, I was about to say, this is where you are definitely not lazy. You've been doing this thing where <laughs> this you've been thing. doing a song a day. You've been yeah. giving people a free song. And, I mean, it's good. It's not just you going, this is my song, good night, Clint. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I need to put that into Evernote and remember this for tonight. You're almost to the end, right? I mean, I'm like, almost like to the end, yeah. Days? I think uh, last night's song, which I recorded, entirely out in my, co my car at 10 o'clock in the evening uh, was, I think, song 26 out of 30 or 27. Uh, right there, right near the end. It's been a lot of recording. It's been really fun, though. I'm glad you did that because we actually did get a feedback question about you and about the music that you create. So oh, okay. why don't you go ahead and start setting up, right. and uh, I'm going to take a little break cool. to thank a sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, folks, you know that I'm all about the DIY. I'm all about the maker community. This is what I do. It's what I enjoy. It's my passion. But how do you make sure you've got the right tools, the right parts, and the right information to do that passion properly? Well, that's when you need the folks over at iFixit. Now, iFixit gets makers. They get DIYers. They understand that you need a one-stop shop, a source for all those parts, all those tools, all the repair guides, and that's exactly what they give you. Now, this episode is brought to you by iFixit, and you know that they like to take stuff apart. They like to teach people how to fix things. They're constantly posting teardowns and repair videos for popular devices like the Galaxy S8, the iPhones, and the Switch. They're also leading the charge in the electronics repair tools industry with their iconic black and blue ProTech toolkit. If you check out the ProTech toolkit in their store, they explain how each piece of the kit was meticulously designed. You won't find a higher quality toolkit like this on the market. Now, don't let that sleek design fool you. 
The toolkit's got both beauty and brawn with high-quality steel bits and tools, tough enough to handle any repair or mod that you throw at them. Now, seriously, I've been using this kit for years, and I got the original set. By now, most of my other kits would have worn down all the bits, they would have destroyed all the spudgers, and the, the kit probably would have been scattered to the winds. Not so with the uh, ProTech toolkit. It's only $59.99, and it comes with a tool roll to make it compact and easy to store. The included 64-bit driver kit has all the bits you'll ever need for just about any DIY electronics repair. A protective case that keeps your bits organized. You just open it up, flip it over, and the bits won't fall out. And the bit kit is held in place by a magnetic mat that doubles as the perfect spot to hold tiny components and screws. Oh, it's got swivel top magnetic precision drivers. It's got a flex extension, also magnetic for hard to reach screws. It's got a wide variety of plastic opening tools, spudgers, and picks to safely poke and pry with, as well as a suction cup with a new fancy handle to remove display assemblies. It's the one that I used when I upgraded Leo's Surface Pro, or Studio, that thing, the big thing with the touchscreen. It's also got iFixit's own rubber handed Jimmy Pry tool and a set of metal spudgers, as well as ESD safe tweezers and a safety strap so you don't destroy your job with static shock. And the best part? iFixit's tools are backed by iFixit's lifetime warranty. Now, you don't need to buy something to get iFixit's free repair resources because, well, they're, they understand this. They're part of the community. They give you more than 25,000 completely free repair guides over at iFixit.com. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to be a better maker. We want you to be a better upgrader. We want you to be a better nerd by getting yourself a ProTech toolkit or maybe one for uh, that loved one in your family. If you want to tackle your next hack, fix, or build with the ProTech Toolkit, just visit ifixit.com slash twit. That's ifixit.com slash twit to snag the fully loaded ProTech Toolkit for only $59.99. Again, ifixit.com slash twit. And we thank iFixit for their support of know-how. Now, Jason, you Hi. have miraculously become... Oh. Like super hippie music guy. Oh, hello. I'm really happy you're all here. I've got a song. I want you to sit back, relax. No, um, we I have to be in a coffee shop for you. <laughs> yeah. yes. In the corner. I feel like I need some sort of a, a mustache. And a scarf. A scarf and maybe yeah. like that little goatee. That little, <laughs> right? Yeah, that'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, well, before we, we get to the, the question, let's yeah. point out really quickly what you've got. You've got the Spire, the Spire Studio that yeah. we, we had well, in the, the geek uh, uh, gift guide. Exactly, that, and, that, and that's part of what this question is all about. This, is, uh, this has kind of been my recording studio for the past month. It's by the folks at Isotope, uh, which is a professional audio uh, software company, and they've gotten into hardware now, and so they've created this. It's $350, but it's basically like an eight-track recording studio. Uh, that also syncs to iOS. There isn't an Android Ooh. version yet. Uh, I will tell you, in the past month, I've used iOS Way almost out. as much, if not more, than I used it when Megan and I did the uh, I, did I, the Android look, I, iPhone swap. It's got the app for the studio. You got to yeah. use it. And also, the headphones. Uh, those were also in the gift guide. These are your uh, your planer headsets, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, oh. the Hi-Fi Man. Uh, headphones. And this is a super cheap guitar. I mean, this is like a $40 it's a Taylor. special. It's a little, I'm realizing it's totally dusty. I should have dusted <laughs> it off. I apologize. That, that's not from lack of playing. I've been playing this guitar a lot past month. Well, let's get to the question. We've got yeah. one from Elizabeth Martin who says, I just watched episode 358 and I was a little offended that you titled it Man Cave. As a full geek and a woman, there was plenty of gear in the show that I would like to have in my den. I don't call it my woman cave because that always starts a bunch of immature giggling. Specifically, I really like the Spire Studio that Jason showed us. As a musician myself, strings and percussions, I've been looking at an easy way to layer tracks. Any chance we could get a demo of how it works? Thanks for the show, and please remember that you have audience members with two X chromosomes. Elizabeth, thank you very much for the question. And Su super important point because yeah. I will admit yeah. entirely, I hate, I hate the term man cave also. It's really just it like what, where, what is your zen your zen den zen den what is your zen den I, you know, I don't, what, I don't what, are the, what is the place that you have that has all the things that you really want I have in a it. lab yeah a lab you, you works. Had a den. and actually last night uh, you didn't even have your den you had a car <laughs> well you do what you got to do everybody <laughs> was asleep I wanted to record a song that required loud strumming and I could, I didn't want to wake them up so I went out in the car absolutely cold. well okay so let's let's break it down we, you've already said that this is the spire which <clears throat> is a very cool device about yeah. three hundred and fifty bucks. 
This is actually what you've been using for all of your songs during this period, right? Yes, and uh, I mean, prior to this, I've been firmly locked into the you know professional you know into Pro Tools, which is kind of professional audio um, an audio workstation for Mac and PC. I mean, prior to this, it was all sit down at a computer, fire up the computer, wait for the product mm -hmm. to load, do the re do the routing, pick the effects, do all this stuff, and it was so much prep to even get to the music part. And what I've loved about this, and you guys are probably sick of hearing me talk about it by now, is that you skip all of that and literally you power it on, you hit record and you go. And it's designed to be super quick. Right. Uh, it could work without the iPad or or it could work in tan tandent, uh, tangent. Tandem? Ta ta tandem. Tandem. Thank yes. you. There's the word. In tandem with I the iPad. I work in tangent. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. Different. No tangent. Um, so, it's really, so it's really great. And if you have it with the iPad, you can actually do things. If you go to the interface, you can go into recording effects and you can actually, you know, you have some different amp uh, modules. So if you plug in a guitar, an actual electric guitar in the back, you can do some amp sims and there's some uh, reverb. I, I am not a musician stuff. unless you count oboe. Okay, uh, but but oh. those effects would would those be like the the pedals that a guitarist would have on the floor that you could just trigger? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, amps for for example, uh, you know, a lot of times what you what you get in audio these days is a lot of um, a lot of uh, companies are actually going into the electronics of very well known amps, very well known. Uh, you know, speaker systems, and they're basically redoing them, following that signal chain, and re-representing them in digital. And they they promise that they sound almost identical to the real thing. And they've been getting closer and closer and closer to that. A company called UAD does this really well, and they have special hardware. I have it hooked up in my setup at home. So I'm not sure if this necessarily gets you all the way there, but it brings a lot of the things that you would get out of an amp, like tremolo and some of the like spring reverb and stuff and like that. And it is a lot easier than carrying around several well, hundred pounds worth of tube amps. And, and that's that's yeah. precisely what this is all about. This is, this is about like, you have an idea, um, as, as, is, as is the case with Elizabeth, you've got strings, you've got percussion, like this happens to me all the time. I have an, a song idea, and I can in my head I, I hear the guitar part, I hear the separate bass part, I hear the vocal, and then I hear the you know the the harmony for the vocal. And in my head, I know that it probably works. But if I can just get it down fast into a recorded right. way, and not be bogged down by the technology that gets in in the Power way. Power up the studio, get everything yes. in place. This I is mean, by, the, by the time that turn this on, totally. and, and go. Totally. By the time all I power everything up, a lot of times I've totally experienced where something will just drop out and like yeah. I can't get it back, and then I'm frustrated. That's that's this is how I was able have been able to do thirty songs in thirty so days. So I think what we need to do is we need to make you like a belt clip for this thing. <laughs> so so that it's anytime on me. it just be, whoosh, this could be my belt buckle. <laughs> <laughs> just always there, ready to record. Okay, that would kick, be a little kick weird, us off. So show me, show me a little bit of the process. So All right. this thing that you've been doing for an entire month, how would it go? So, um, and this, this might, I, I will forewarn you, it might sound weird because we've got the, the microphone coming from here. We've also got a live microphone through here. I think it's muted right now. Now it's passing through. So it'll, things will sound better after it's recorded. When I'm recording it, you're going right. to sound just how bad of a player and a singer I actually am. Don't, Thankfully don't in here, do that. No, 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 but it's, but it's true. Like there, There's something to be said for layering, and that's part of the beauty of multi-track recording. Um, it's certainly something that I hide behind because it's so effective. So what I would do is I would sit down, and by the way, we have a dog. We got a dog a couple of months ago. Her name is Sugar. There are a million songs out there that have Sugar in the title, but one that's a favorite of my daughter's in our home, and they go to Google Home all the time, and they say, hey, G, play Sugar Sugar by the Archies. There you go. And uh, so I, I figured instead of coming up with something you know super creative on the fly, we'll just do like a, a part of that. So what I would do is uh, do hit the sound check. And basically what that does is like an automatic gain. It's I could follow it through the entire time. Okay. It's setting the levels. You can do it manually with this little slider here and set them, but I find it to be pretty effective. This microphone right here is what we're gonna rely on. It's not the world's best microphone, but it actually does a really good job. So I'm gonna go ahead and record just a piece of Sugar Sugar, and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna add layers on top of it. So here we go. So then you stop. 
and we got you saying boom right there at the very end. That's what that little <laughs> mountain Oops. is there. Sorry. Okay, so now so um, I'm going to go in now. here and mute the microphone on the spire so we can actually hear the playback just as a little preview. Oh, nice. Now, when okay. you're doing this, are you hearing all the parts or are you just hearing the guitar part? Right now, all we're hearing is a guitar. No, but part. like in your head. Are, are you, oh, you, yeah. Oh, oh like like, like before process. I sit down to do this. Right. Yeah, I hear the guitar. I hear the bass. I hear I, I hear all the parts. I, I don't know how to explain it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there. Yeah, it's just I, it's in there. Yeah. Okay. I, and I mean, I've I've struggled with it for years. It's been a, it's been a constant struggle. Is like I've got this stuff in my head. How do I get it out the way it sounds in my head? And I've figured out ways around it. This is the closest that I've been able to come okay. to do it quickly. So we've got our guitar part, right? Uh, what's a what's another thing that's that's fun to do? How about an egg shaker? Um, and actually, I'm gonna say that I don't need the guitar anymore, so we'll put it away so I don't break it. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone that wanted me to smash it over. We'll get you a different table. guitar for that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute this, and we'll do the egg shaker part. <laughs> All right, so now you've got that, right? Um, we'll go ahead and mute that so we don't have the pass-through audio. Here's what it sounds like with that layer. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and you can go into mix and play around with the mix. Two is the shaker. Go ahead and set oh, so it Oh, so you can there. set it spatially, too. Yeah, and you can, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. So Very you can play cool. with it really quick. All right, so we've got two layers. That was super fast, right? Now here's where I get slightly embarrassed because uh, when I sing, I get a little embarrassed. But uh, this, the, the lyrics are pretty easy. We get it. We sugar, get it. sugar, yeah. oh, honey, honey, you're my candy girl. And you got me wanting you. So here we go. Oh, hold on, hold on. I don't think I unmuted it. Uh, we'll undo that. You can see how fast you can move on this, though. It's a good illustration of that. And actually, when I do vocals, I do like to go into effects. These are record effects. Uh, it's a little, they're, can, they're can a little I add heavy. These after? Or you no, to, it's okay. just for before. Okay. And when I first got this, I thought, man, I want to be able to tweak these afterwards. What I've realized, though, is that that slows down the process. Right. Here, you commit. You say, I'm doing this now, and there's no turning back. It's almost like the old days, like the Beatles, when they did the multi-track recording, when they were kind of creating the world of multi-track recording. They had to commit on all of their mixing right. decisions. They had four tracks to record on, and they were bouncing between all of them. So all of that depth that you hear in Beatles recordings, that's them committing instead of what we have now, which is I have a million tracks and I can do anything I want to them Record up to the a very bunch end. of stuff and I'll use the stuff that maybe sounds good and yes. I'll process it beyond belief. Absolutely, okay. so I'm gonna unplug that. All right, so uh, now I'm gonna do the vocals and I think we're good. Oh, actually, I need to do sound check. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little twisted here. Sugar, oh honey, honey. That's probably good enough. Okay, here we go. Oh, sugar. Oh, honey, honey. You are my candy girl. And you got me wanting you. All right, so vocals, I get a little intimidated by those. That's where the doubling comes in. Doubling, if you don't know, is a really good way. It's basically recording the same part twice and when you play them over the top of each other, they're not perfectly matched, but it evens out. So if I'm pitchy oh. in one of my goes, I might be better on the other one, and it's almost like they blend into each other and it makes it sound more solid. So pretty much anything I've done with this is at least double vocals. It's like HDR for audio, basically. Kind of, and it actually gives it a little, yes, a little bit, I, I see where you're going with that. It also gives it a little bit of a flanging effect that, okay. that yeah. has a yeah, really yeah, nice yeah. sound to it. So we'll do that now. Oh, sugar. Oh, honey, honey. You are my candy girl. And you got me wanting you. All right, so now we'll mute that. And we'll go ahead and play it. And we'll get the true representation of where we're at right now. Oh, sugar. Oh, honey, honey. Oh, I hear that. Yeah, that's nice. You are my candy girl. 
and then you can get into uh, you know other layers. Do you want to do a hand clap? Pass? Let's uh, okay. Okay. I, I, uh, I have no rhythm. It's okay. All you have to do is the downbeat. Or well, no, you you would be doing where the snare would be. Sugar. And let's take off the verb, uh, or at least put on a different one. There's a, there's one called a deep space vibes. Da, da, da. Yeah, it sounds sounds a little boxy, but I think I'll go for it anyways. Okay, so now, and if you and if you want to follow my lead on the first one, then and I'll then follow up, your lead. Okay, so I'll, yeah, that's not a problem. All right, here we go. Uh, I think we're unmuted. I'll shoot up. All right. One thing I didn't do is sound check, so that might be a little it's bit over, a little bit. but whatever. <laughs> you get the point. So now we'll play it one last time, and I think you get the picture on this. Um, although I might do one more. <laughs> it's fun. Oh, all right, so you kind this. of get the picture, this is right? So cool. So here you've got now, in, in a matter of like five minutes, I've got five different tracks beginning to end. I can go up to eight tracks. Oh, sugar. Oh, sugar. Oh, honey, honey. You are my candy girl. And you got me wanting you. And that was oh, the last one. Harmony. And a little harmony. Oh, sugar. Oh, honey, honey. You know, I've seen videos where people do you all the parts of the song. Girl. What's and that? I've seen videos where people do all the parts of the song, and it's yeah. always got me kind of mystified. Yeah. This makes it seem so simple. I mean, it you does. still have to have the talent, but wow. It does, and then the beauty from there, and why it's been so easy for me to keep this up really rapidly. You know, like sometimes I will sit down in the time that it takes my wife to drop the kids off at school in the morning, which is like 25 minutes. There have been times where she closes the door, and I'm like, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> and literally, she walks through the door when I'm uploading the SoundCloud. <laughs> it ends up being that easy. So you go here to this little share, and there's a button to upload to SoundCloud, and you can just tap that. It uploads to your SoundCloud. It puts a little hashtag in there that says Made with Spire. Um, anyone that follows you on SoundCloud, it's up there immediately. So you don't cool. have to think about it. There's also other ways to like export it, or you can even share a project with another owner of the Spire so you can collaborate. Yeah. The point is, the beauty of this thing is just how fast you can prototype songs. Yeah. It's it's this is to music what a 3D printer is to you know a maker the, the yeah, idea of good, just being able to make something yeah. really quick and then improve it and improve it. Baris in the chat room actually has a really good point, which is you can do this with Audacity. Yes, 100%. Oh, yeah. Or any audio editing program. That's uh, I know. mean that's what they're designed. That's what this is really yeah. emulating. It's, it's, it's well, exactly not like emulating, it. but I mean they're all they're all birds of the same feather. But but the difference is as you mentioned, it's that startup time. Right. You have a device that you can literally turn on and be creating in five seconds. Yeah, and by the way, this isn't plugged into power. This yeah, is all battery, battery powered. I mean, you can plug into power, but you you charge up the battery. And so I've made my daughter's room a recording space because <laughs> my wife was downstairs t with a client. I've made the car my, my recording space many times because it was too late for me to record in my den. Um, Wait, did I've you record, record when you were camping? Uh, out, out don't. The, the wilderness? No, but that, but you, I mean, you totally you could. could. Yeah. And I've always wanted to be able to do that, you know? Like, that that's a really great idea. It's the next album. Yeah, right. <laughs> in the woods. Yellow gold, in the woods. Um, I can really think of the, you the can album know, art. There, on, on one hand, this has been done before. Multi-track recording is not new. No. On the other hand, a hardware device that is designed, built with ease of use in mind, to the point to where it just allows you to literally turn it on, record. I could do all of this la layered recording without this interface. So I it would, as you record, as you can see on the, just to show you real quick, that's one track, that's another track, that's another track. As I record, the whole thing gets littered right. with all these tracks and I can like redo it by tapping it and it starts to kind of fade. That tells me that I'm gonna re-record over it. I can mute it from here, all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's designed to allow musicians to just get that idea down. And maybe it's not something that you release 
on an album. No, but but it gets the idea yeah. out there so that you can go back later and treat it. It's something that you can play with. And, yeah. and all of our audience it's a toy. understands it's that. A it's a toy, a, but it's a powerful yeah, toy. Exactly. And that's that's how you learn. You play. You go, yeah. oh, oh, remember that one time I did that one thing and it sounded really I wonder if I could use that here. Mm -hmm. That's what this encourages. Yeah. And I, I gotta say, I uh, I did studio engineering back in the day where I had multiple like four track reel to reel. Yeah. And I remember doing editing on that and that's back in the days where you literally cut the tape. I mean, you want why is there a razor on those editing tools because that's what we used to have. Yeah. You'd cut it diagonally yep. and you'd splice it together. That's right. And this would literally have replaced an entire room of of equipment. Uh, that's just cool. That's pro progress, folks. That's progress. We're living in the future. Yeah. I love it. So, uh, yeah, check it out. I think it's Spire.live if you want to check out the hardware itself. Elizabeth, I hope that answers your question. If you are a musician and you've got 350 bucks, uh, this is actually something that you might want to give yourself for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it'll even fit into your stocking. I'm just saying. Or belt. <laughs> Sorry, you if you want, I seriously, buckle. I will build you a belt buckle for this. <laughs> just oh man, I know you would too. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like a what, like a ammo strap. A, a, that I like that there, idea right? even better. Okay. Uh, when we come back, uh, we've got a little special treat for you. I I want to in the next two episodes give you some previews of some projects that we've got coming in the new year. I think you're going to like this one. I'm doing a li I'm calling it a lie pie or a power pie. No. Oh. The whole idea is, is to create an enclosure for a Raspberry Pi that has its own battery backup that can take multiple voltages so I could do things like powering it off uh, my laptop adapter or USB, a solar panel, whatever it might be, with interchangeable tops so that as I go on, I can just pop modules on and have it be different things. That sounds cool. Want to see how we put that, put that together? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to get to that in just a second. First, let's take another moment to thank another sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, folks, I know that you like your electronics gear. I mean, it's what we like, right? It's not just shiny, it's productive. Things like the Spire allow us to create. They allow us to indulge ourselves in our fancy and our imagination. But what's not cool is when we lose them. And we always do. Electronics are getting smaller. Our keys always have a mind of their own. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a technology that would allow me to use my phone, my tablet, whatever device I might be carrying to make sure I never lose anything again. Well, that's exactly what you can do with Tracker. Now, this episode of Know How is brought to you by Tracker. It's a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. You just visit the Tracker and they're gonna show you exactly how you keep your things from wandering away. It's for our keys, it's for our laptops, it's for our bags, it's for the little gizmos that will make our life more fun and productive. Now, eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device. And now they've done it again with the all-new Tracker Pixel. The Tracker Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things because it's the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You place it on whatever you tend to lose. Again, your keys, your wallet, your remote. It's small enough to fit on your smallest items. And when you misplace an item that has a Tracker Pixel attached, you just go to the Tracker app on your smartphone, press a button, and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in just seconds. It even has a powerful LED light so you can find your items in the dark. Now, what I really like about this system is it works the other way around. If you lose your phone, and who among us hasn't lost their phone, you just press the button on one of the Tracker pixels that is linked to your phone, and your phone will ring even if it's on silent. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because Tracker is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. As long as your device is within range of another Tracker user, you can still see where it is. And Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means that you truly have nothing to lose. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to experience device bliss. We want you to never lose anything again. We want you to try the Tracker. Tracker makes a great gift, and during this holiday season, you can save 20% off your order when you go to thetracker.com slash knowhow. That's the track, R, as in the letter R, dot com slash knowhow for 20% off. Again, thetracker.com slash knowhow. And we thank Tracker for their support of knowhow. Okay, Jason, let's do a little something something. We got a bunch of stuff up on the desk. Stuff. That's that's what I like Technical to do. Technical term. Yeah, it's you know it's a, it's a thing. It's a, definitely a thing. <laughs> uh, so what I've what I've done the last couple of weeks, I've been working on you know three or four different 3D projects. This is one that I've I've actually I think it's to the point where I'm ready to start committing to a couple of the de design decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you go to the overhead, this is uh, this is the stuff that you need for what I'm calling the LiPi. 
Uh, of course, I've got a Raspberry Pi. I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3, but this case should work with every version of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you just might have to modify the top piece just a tiny bit. There's not many pieces to it. There's this outer shell, which is, this is also a copy of. Then there's this inner shell, which is the, uh, the power pack. So it allows me to sort of uh, you know, protect all the electronics from the power cells that I'm going to be putting into this thing. Now, uh, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the items that are going to be going into this. If you go to that first link, Alex, you do need a Raspberry Pi. I would suggest a Raspberry Pi 3, although just know that a Raspberry Pi 3 is also the most power intensive unit of the Raspberry Pi series. In fact, it uses up twice as much power as a Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, so if you are going for longevity and you don't need all the power, maybe go with a 2 instead of a 3. You also need a 5 volt UBEC. That's a UBEC. That's a Universal Battery Eliminator Circuit. If you go to the link for that, I'm using a Hobbywing. Uh, it's about 3 bucks for this thing. And the nice thing is it accepts anything from 5.5 volts all the way up to 26 volts. So you get a really wide range of power that uh, you can use to both charge and power your Raspberry Pi. You're also going to need three 18650. This is a standard power uh, cell size, LiPo cells. Now, these are 4,000 milliamp hour each. The ones I would suggest, if you go to that link there, is, are 3,800 milliamp hour. Uh, you, of course, you can choose larger or smaller. It's going to cost you about eight bucks for three of these. Uh, go ahead and pick yourself up one. Uh, you're also going to need a 5.5 millimeter, 2.1 millimeter DC jack. That's right here. If you go to the link for that, it, it's cheaper if you buy them in, in bulk. Uh, these are actually really good. I like the metal ones because they look better and they last longer. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you about a buck. Uh, you're also going to need a rocker switch because this is our power. That's going to, again, co cost you less than a dollar if you buy it in bulk. Uh, a momentary switch which is this one right here, uh, I decided that I wanted to, uh, you know, be able to, uh, to gradually, gracefully shut down the pie rather than just killing pie. Right, yeah, right. Right. Because uh, they tell you not to kill it immediately, although I do it all the time. Right. It doesn't seem to break my pie, but I guess there's the potential for it. Precisely. For, for wiping the memory specifically, right? Yeah, yeah, you, can, oh, you, yeah you can corrupt the file, right. uh, the storage device. Got it. Uh, you also need this. Uh, this is a lithium-ion battery charger with protection, if you go to the link for that. It's about a, a, a buck once you buy them in bulk, uh, or actually less. So that's five pieces for 425. This is important because what this allows me to do is to supply this with five volts. It will charge the batteries. It will also not allow them to overcharge, and it will not allow them, uh, allow them to be overdrained. Hmm. Because if you do either of those things, you end up with the dangerous batteries uh, okay. that you don't want because fire is bad. I think we've established yes. that at the beginning of the <laughs> show. That could the, be the, the title show. of the show. Uh, also, some, some connectors. Uh, you don't need these specifically, but I like them because they make it easier to put the project together. I've got a bunch of Wakera and JST connectors. Uh, if you go to the links for those, uh, I, I, just buy, I have so many of these because I'm always using them. They're going to cost you between $0.10 cents and $0.60 cents each. So just get yourself a bunch. So what did I want to do with this project? I, I had a couple of power uh, project requirements. The first thing is I wanted a, a way to power the Pi without using the USB port, mm -hmm. it, which is right here. Because you've, you've all seen it. If you've got a Raspberry Pi, you've got maybe USB and Ethernet coming out this way, and then you've got power coming out this way, and it just makes it unwieldy. So mm -hmm. I said, no, no, I want everything on one side. So power, connectivity all on one side. The second thing is I wanted a way to be able to switch from line power to battery power without disrupting the Pi. So th it, this is the universe, uninterruptible power source part of the project. In other words, I can have it plugged into the wall, I could have it plugged into a USB connector, I could have it plugged into a solar panel, and then disconnect or lose that power and nothing changes. The, mm -hmm. the, the unit still operates just as if it had always had power. I also wanted uh, to be able to operate for at least three hours on complete battery power. Uh, because three hours is the length of a movie, so if I'm using it as a media thing, <laughs> that there makes you go. sense. Uh, that makes sense. I wanted NUC size. That's the next unit of computing that Intel introduced, and this is actually just about the same size as a NUC. Uh, just because there are products out there designed for NUC uh, units, so this, if I design it the same way, I can now use those products for add-ons. Hmm. Uh, and the, the last thing is, I wanted a way to gracefully power down the Pi without destroying the SD card, and that's why I've got that momentary switch, because I can trigger a Python script on the Raspberry Pi when I push it to say, go ahead and do the shutdown command instead of just dropping power out. Uh, I like the, the, the touch. Oh, the, yeah. Yeah, the you little, got the little twit the little logo. Twi twit logo flag. 
Well, that's so that's the thing that that uh, covers the SD card. Ah, okay. Right? Uh, that's so nice. yeah, the, right. so I have a way to get the SD card. So uh, the way that this goes together is actually really really simple. I actually don't need all those components anymore. I've got most of them in here already. So I've got my power switch. I've got my momentary switch. I've got LEDs that will show power, and then also uh, when I wire it up, it will turn green when it's ready to sh actually shut down. So it tells me when it's done. Oh, okay. Uh, these have been this. I might actually integrate into the box. I decided not to do it this time just because it's easier to work on the power um, mm -hmm. devices outside of the case. So the cells are just going to go in like this. The power board actually has a seating housing that goes right there. This goes over the top. And what it does is it keeps the cells from moving because mm -hmm. you don't want the cells moving around inside the case. I'm probably going to integrate that into this. It will just become one unit. This has a little notch, so it slides in like that, and then it just clips down and you, you screw it in. This goes in here and then has three hold down points, just uh, three millimeter screws. This goes over the top, and then, let's see, again, this is what I like about having these connectors. I can connect that to this. This goes to here. And now I've got my power tied in, and the Raspberry Pi just goes right there. And if I can find where I put the screwdriver. Now those batteries, when you drop them into the housing, what were they connecting to? What were the, where, where were the contacts I, I took that out just because I didn't want to short the batteries during the demonstration. Oh, I got you. Yeah, okay. But okay. I, I actually, uh, I've, it's, it's just like you have in a battery compartment, yeah. little clips. So when you okay. plug it in there, the friction holds it in. Just, I missed that part. I was like, wait a minute, they're, they're magic, magic batteries. No, no, no. no. They, just, <laughs> they just dump the power into the pie. It just goes right through the plastic. Yes, yeah, so they just pour it in. <laughs> you know, we get some next-gen stuff here on Know How. <laughs> And this just goes right over the top, nice. and there you go. So this Dang, this is that. this is what this will look like. I've got four screws on the side here that actually keep the uh, the cover from going down. Uh, now this is a, still a draft, so a lot of things could change before this is done. But I like this. It's it's compact. It's the right size, and you know, depending on the Raspberry Pi that you use in here, you can get anywhere from three all the way up to about 20 hours of power. Uh, which is fantastic. Now let's take a look at the power calculations. I know that this particular Pi is gonna is gonna run me about five watts watt hours, uh, five watts per hour. So five watt hours, right? Okay. That's my draw. Um, I know that every cell in here can provide about four thousand milliamp hours times three point seven volts. That gives me about fifteen watt hours. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 45 watt hours of power to play with, but we can't go all the way down to the bottom. You don't want to drain a battery to zero. 30%, 25%, right. that's about safe. That's what that circuit's going to do. It's going to cut it off so that I don't completely discharge. Uh, so we should count on about 29 to 35 watt hours of usable power. Uh, so that's just under six hours of full power operation. That's with wow. everything on. Like the, the CPU is full power. The, uh, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth are both on and being used. I turn any of that off. I turn off the Wi-Fi or I turn off the Bluetooth, and that six hour that goes, goes up, up to eight hours or so. Uh, so you know this is this is actually a really cool unit. Nice. Uh, and the nice thing about this is if you've got a printer, including all the filament, this is going to be a, about a fifteen dollar case, uh, which actually is a lot cheaper than anything you're going to buy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, normally we don't make cheaper things. We make things that are not as yeah, good, <laughs> yeah, totally. but expensive. Yeah, it's nice. It's very well built. I'm always so impressed with your with your capabilities on on 3D printing well, these let's, components. Well, let's take a look at uh, what those capabilities are. If you go to my computer, Alex, um, we're gonna. What I actually have is this is the 3D model that I've been using to create these things. So I've got the top, the bottom. I've got the battery compartment and the lid for the battery compartment. This thing down here at the below, this was just something that I I was messing around with, and I decided. I didn't like it, but I didn't want to delete it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, when I'm messing with these models, like this is the main part. This is the, the base. This is everything that, that fits into it. These are the individual components that went into making this base. So I've got my support columns, which both tie on the Raspberry Pi and keep the battery compartment from moving anywhere, because that's the worst thing that could happen. That, that's the heaviest piece of the device. If that's sloshing around inside the case, you can damage things. Mm -hmm. I've got my ports for my power my power switch, my momentary switch to do a graceful shutdown. These are the two ports for the uh, the LEDs that will tell me what state the unit is in. This is for the power connector. Uh, and then this, these are, that's just a template that I created 
that shows where the ports are on the Raspberry Pi. Pretty much the only thing you need to, to know for designing a case for the Raspberry Pi is where are the ports and where are the mounting points. So if you, if you have those, you can design anything around that hmm. um, because those, those are the only things that can't change. Right. You, yeah, you can't change yeah. the mounting points and you can't change the I.O. ports. Everything else uh, has been uh, revved as I've gone on. In fact, this, this project has changed significantly since version one. This is version six. Uh, so the batteries used to be lengthwise, now they're widthwise. Uh, this battery compartment didn't used to have those little things in there. That, that's the shapes for holding the cells. Uh, I, in the first version, I just basically plopped the cells in and hoped that they wouldn't move around. That was not a good thing. They did move around. They ripped themselves off from their, uh, their cabling, and they started a fire. So, hmm. yeah. you know, it's strange, Jason. I like where you've gotten to then. Yeah. Now. Oh, it's weird how many decisions on know-how are driven by, and then it started a fire. <laughs> I started a fire, so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this again, this was something that originally all of this was just going to be part of this case. I didn't, I didn't intend on having these centerpieces, but what I found out when I was doing assembly the first time was it's a pain to try to do all of the the connections inside this one box because this is already tight over here. There's a lot of connections over here. So I separated them so I can do the power uh, separately from all the connections, all the switches. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is, the, this is the fun part. This little piece on the top, I can modify any way I want. This is the, the generic version. And so it's gonna be a, a standard template. But I've got right now like six different versions of this. One includes a cooling unit in case I know I'm gonna be running the pie really, really uh, hot. Uh, there's also one that has a screen, a very uh, two-line I squared C screen, so that it reports the IP address in case I want to use it as a Tor node mm -hmm. or say uh, I, I want to use it as a, a pie hole to, to block ads. That way, I don't have to have it hooked up to a monitor. I can just see the the pertinent information right on the, on the top. Yeah, right. Uh, I've got another top that I created that has a controller for solar panels. So if you wanted to make this a solar powered pie, uh, it actually does all the solar power pie. regulation. Yeah, with within the top. So. This is going to be, I mean, right now, it's, it's very basic, but this is going to be an important part going into the future because this will allow me to take the basic design, the basic unit at the bottom, and basically turn it into any kind of pie that I need. Now, Virgil in the chat room asks a very, I, I would imagine, important question. Cooling inside the case. Right, right. Uh, that's, that's why I, I, I have the, the lids. Uh, th this basic lid is probably never going to be used. The only reason why it's like this right now is because it's a draft. But I do have one that has a cooling fan. Okay. Um, I also have another one that just has a big heat sink that's connected to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to depend on what kind of Raspi you right. put in here. If you put a two, you don't really need to cool it. If you put a three and you're planning to run multimedia and gaming, you probably yeah. do want to cool yeah. it. Uh, the other thing is the materials that it's made of. This is PLA. Uh, I don't want to do ABS because ABS is toxic uh, and that's not fun to print. But uh, one of the materials I'm playing with is PETG. It's a different type of filament, much stronger, and I think it just looks better. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can handle higher temperatures, so I wouldn't have to worry about a cooling device possibly melting the gaze. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want that either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the LiPi. So you're going to awesome. see this probably, I, I think, I'll, I'll, I should have this all figured out by the time I get back from CES. Nice. Uh, so this will be coming in, in the new year, and you will see it a lot because I'm going to be doing case mods. I'm going to be doing the, the tops every time we do a new Raspberry Pi project. I just, I just thought it was time that we created something that was specifically know-how. Yeah, I love it. I love, uh, I love the, the, do you sand this down? Nope. Or is it? No, that's straight okay. off the printer. Because that looks, I mean, it's super, super slick. Well, you know it's, what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm used to seeing some 3D printed things, and yeah. they look really rough. They're really rough. This is actually not even, th this was printed at 0.15. Mm -hmm. I can print at 0 0.06, so I can get much more fine than this. The, actually, there is a fun thing that you could do. If you wanted to print this out of ABS, you take this, put it into an enclosure with, a, like, a bottle cap full of acetone, mm -hmm. and just close it. And what will happen is the fumes will start to melt the plastic a little bit, and it smooths everything off. So it, oh, like wow. all those layers that you see whenever you 3D mm -hmm. print. So if you go to the overhead maybe, or the, the side view, there we the go. Layers yeah, those layers that you can hear when you go like this. Yeah, those all smooth out. Oh wow. Which is kind of cool, but again, toxic. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stay away from it. So that's the LiPi. Now, Very nice. Jason, yeah. we're out of time, but I did okay. want to throw in one more thing from the Google Plus group, because again, our audience is the best. Their audience, they're, they're awesome. 
And we actually got something for, uh, for those people who want to take their makery to the next level. This, is, uh, this was sent to me by Chris and his son, Vlad. And I, I don't have a, a graphic for this. I'm just going to read this one off. He said, hi, Robert. I just watched a show where you mentioned you'll be leaving next year. Twit won't be the same without you all. Thank you. you. Just wanted to send you something as a token of my appreciation for all that I've learned from know-how. From 3D printers to quadcopters to Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. Wow, we've done a lot of stuff. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've mostly just futzed around with them. I've been able to use them to turn my son onto engineering and electronics at an early age. Very nice. Which has undoubtedly broadened his horizons. He's always talking about wanting to make robots <laughs> when he grows up. Great. Anyway, I made a few of these cases for Raspberry Pi Zeros on my CNC mill. That is awesome. I would love a good CNC mill. And thought I'd make carrying one on your travels a little easier. This is for the 1.3 version, though it will fit a W2. Just not sure how much wireless strength will be degraded. Not that it really needs it, needs it, but a little heat paste between the CPU and the little pad in the top should help dissipate heat through the case. Anyways, thanks for sharing your knowledge, Chris and son, Vlad. Thank you so <laughs> much, but this is awesome. And I, I kept it in the wrapping because I don't want to scratch it. My fingerprints are probably over this. This is milled aluminum, folks. Wow. This is so cool, seriously. Again, my look fingerprints are everywhere, but I gotta pop this open because you're gonna love the inside. This is this is what it looks like when you mill. Wow. <laughs> that's an actual CNC machine. That is. Oh, that's really impressive. It's super so impressive. How much does it cost to do this? Well, I mean, it's I mean, nothing. It's just the cost of the aluminum and the uh, and the power. But you have to have a good machine. I, right. I, we have a CNC milling machine, but it's. It's a toy, and it, it's nowhere near as precise as this. This is, oh, this is great. I mean, this is so, I mean, this is... I kind of like really the I'm mean, kind of speechless. It, fe it feels like something you'd buy in the store, you know what I mean? Wait, like didn't you try to buy one of these? What? You tried to get a Raspberry Pi in a steel case, didn't you? Oh, I, I, I ordered a three, and then a steel case with heat dissipation for because I was going to overclock the three. Um, and then Amazon delivered it to <laughs> Amazon delivered Shots. it to, I think, the wrong house, and whoever they delivered it to never ended up giving it to me. <laughs> so I, we, I got my money back because it wasn't a big deal. But Chris, but yeah, awesome this is really deal. Nice. I also, I, yeah, this is so. This is where you would put the heat paste, and this would make contact with the, the main uh, processor on the Raspberry Pi Zero. Dang. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely this is like next thing. level stuff right, right? here. I I can't. Make, he's like, I oh, have you know, no ability to make anything like this. You know, I've learned a lot from you. I, I just I just threw this together. Here you go. I don't, it's like, what, what are you like talking someone, about? You hey, can sell this. I love all the tech you've been showing off. <laughs> By the way, I'm sending you a fusion reactor just because I got a bunch of them, <laughs> and I thought maybe you might thought want maybe one. you might want one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's folks, awesome. We know that this has been a lot of information and we want to make it easy for you to get to everything. Uh, you're going to want to go to our show notes. In fact, that's where we pulled today's show. Uh, uh, well, actually, from the, the Google Plus group. But you start with the show notes at twit.tv slash kh. That's for know-how. There you'll find all of our back episodes, places to download them, as well as a place to subscribe if you want to support the show, if you want it to continue, if you want us to get even geekier, please go to twit.tv slash kh Click on a drop-down menu and choose a version of your choice, audio, video, or high-definition video, and it will be automatically downloaded into your device of choice. Also, don't forget that we've got a Google Plus page. Again, that's where we get everything. That's the feedback episode. Just go to Google Plus, look for know-how, ask to join. There's a very short approval process, but I approve everyone. And then if you try to spam the group, I ban you. In fact, you're doing this for Tech News Weekly, right? Or no, for no, all for, for all about Android. Yeah, we, we had let that uh, community kind of <laughs> go a little, it, for a little bit oh, too long. And then I was like, you know what? Are like, it doesn't need to be this way. So I've yeah. been moderating it similar to what you're doing with NoHap. Yeah, and it's simple. I just, I just switch it so that everyone it's has to be approved. Difficult. And I approve everyone. Yeah. And, but then I have the spam filter set up, so if someone tries to spam, it doesn't actually go in. Right. It gets caught in the spam filter, and then they just click ban. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. But go there, post your questions, post your projects, post pictures and videos, and we will bring them into our shows. Uh, again, just go to Google Plus and look for know-how. Also, don't forget that you can find us on the socials. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. I'm on Twitter at Jason Howell and uh, yellowgoldmusic.com if you want to get in on the final 48 hours of the Kickstarter. Yeah, and actually, let's, let's talk about that, because that's we had that awesome segment right in the middle where yeah. you talk about the Spire. Uh, you do have a new album 
uh, yeah. coming in. You did a Kickstarter for six thousand dollars. You passed five thousand. We're in the last what 48, 72 hours. Something like yeah, that. and in the in, I mean, in the, even in the past day, it's like shot up. And I haven't. Oh, see, now oh. it's at fifty seven. Hey. So it's like it's creeping up to the goal. This is ba basically at this goal, I'm allowed to do all the CD printing, the, the posters with Scott Johnson's art. Nice. Uh, another friend of mine, Ben Minter, is going to get his art on a poster and some you know graphics in the case, as well as professional mastering. I had hoped to get here and then move it even beyond this, another couple thousand to get a professional mix done. I don't think we're going to get there, but I'm really happy with the mix that I've come up with anyway. So if you want to contribute, you have 45 hours to go if you're watching this live, less if you're getting it on podcast. Right, right. Uh, just go to yellowgoldmusic.com. You'll see the link there. And uh, yeah, this should come out early next year. Wait, what was the link again? Yellowgoldmusic.com. That's well, how do you pronounce that link, though? How do you pronounce it? Yeah, yellowgoldmusic.com. Ye yellowgoldmusic.com. Well, how's it spelled? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> exactly how it sounds. <laughs> well, please, folks, you got to support your artist. Listen to some of his free songs. On uh, SoundCloud. If you go to SoundCloud, SoundCloud, you'll find me there. There you go. And, you'll and, get all and those trust songs. me, he's an artist you're going to want to back. Thanks. Also, thanks to the third member of our crew. He's the guy who sits behind the board and he pushes all of our buttons. We call him Ralph. Excuse Ralph me, Padre. I'm in the plenum. <laughs> right. Get out of the plenum. This is really weird. That's actually a good show title. In the plenum. In the plenum. <laughs> Dwelling uh, in the plenum. We put Ralph in the plenum, but you can always find Ralph at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. Excuse me, Padre. In the plenum, it's pronounced Alex. Well, you know, plenum's like a totally different place. So, I mean, it's an alternate universe yeah, back here. Yeah. Uh, until next time, I am Father Robert Ballasare. And I'm Jason Howell. And now that you know how... Go to the plenum! Go to the plenum!